Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have been advised by the organizing committee to start our, uh, our event today. First of all, I would like to say good morning to you all. Very good morning uh, to our ambassador, uh, His Excellency Dr. Desra Percaya, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Kingdom and permanent uh, representative to the IMO. Selamat pagi, Pak Dubes. I also would like to welcome our distinguished panelists today. And I was advised that we have our Deputy Chief of Mission from Canberra here. Good morning to you too. I am Wina Ratnosari from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I will be your moderator uh, today. At the, uh, at the outset, uh, also, I would like to welcome everyone to today's event, which is part of Seafarer Talk Series, a regular event organized by the Indonesian Embassy in London as a discussion platform to address issues related to seafarers. It was triggered by the emerging issues involving uh, seafarers, noting the importance of seafarers' role in global shipping. The current webinar aims to highlight the adoption of the UN resolution and how it can highlight the importance of seafarers protection and crew change, particularly amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we begin, allow me to lay down some ground rules. I would ask all participants to have their microphones muted uh, while the speakers are giving their presentation. And also, we will take your questions after all the speakers have delivered their presentation. Uh, for the speakers, uh, kindly be advised that uh, each of speaker will be given 10 minutes uh, for the presentation. And for the question and answer session for the last 30 minutes of this uh, event, uh, for the participants, uh, Kindly keep your questions short and simple so everyone can have a chance to participate in the discussion. And as a start, I would like to invite our first speaker, His Excellency Dr. Desra Percaya, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Kingdom and permanent representative to the IMO. Uh, excuse me, Your Excellency, before... Uh, uh, your presentation begins. Allow me to read briefly your CV for the participants. Ambassador Desra Parchaya, PhD, is the current ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Republic of Indonesia to the UK, accredited to the Republic of Ireland and the IMO. Previously, he was the Director General for Asia, Pacific, and Africa at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia from May 2016 to October 2020. He was responsible for bilateral relations between Indonesia and 114 friendly countries, as well as Indonesia's membership in regional and sub-regional organization, including Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, Indian Ocean Dream Association, Asia-Africa Conference, Pacific Island Forum, Pacific Islands Development Forum, Melanesian Spearhead Group, Asia Cooperation Dialogue, etc. Throughout his career, Ambassador Desra has engaged in Indonesia's foreign policy making, particularly regarding international peace and security, disarmament, human rights, economic development, as well as social and humanitarian affairs. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, um, moderator. I am a bit embarrassed, everyone. Uh, uh, introduce myself in this kind of forum. It shows how old I am uh, in, in compared to the to the rest of you here. Uh, Miss Cathy Ware, permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the IMO and director of maritime service of the UK. His Excellency, Mr. Mohamed Koba, deputy permanent representative of the Republic of Indonesia to the UN in New York. Bapak Antoni Arif Priyadi, Director for Sea Traffic and Transport, Ministry of Transport of the Republic of Indonesia. My dear brother, Pak Yuda Nugraha, Director for Protection of Citizens and Legal Entities Overseas, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. And Mr. Ismail Kopos Delgado from the International Maritime Organization. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning from London to you all. It is an honor for me to welcome you all today. This is only my third day, third day in London, but I'm very keen to participate in this important webinar as it is indeed one of my quick wins to further strengthen Indonesia's role within the framework of IMO. Colleagues, situated between the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean and blessed with archipelagic sea lanes, we believe and Indonesia believes that it is important to secure the global supply chain and international seaborne trade. Moreover, as one of the world's largest seafarer contributing countries, Indonesia has always placed the protection of seafarers as a priority. As a member of the IMO Council, it is incumbent upon Indonesia together with international community as a whole to highlight the importance of seafarers protection under relevant international laws and to ensure that their basic rights are not being undermined particularly amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. These great tasks are imperative for us, not only from the perspective of humanity per se, but also good business conduct point of view, namely to ensure the integrity of the global supply chain, particularly during this difficult situation. As we witness the growing crisis and the increasing number of seafarers who were stranded during the pandemic, we took the initiative to bridge the concern emanating from the IMO regime to the UN General Assembly. Indonesia is committed to participating actively in norm shipping for better, safe and secure shipping with hope that it will garner global attention and a stronger basis for the facilitation of crew change. The process has borne fruit in the UN GA General Resolution on international cooperation to address challenges faced by seafarers as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic to support global supply chains adopted by consensus on the 1st of December earlier this year with 71 co-sponsors. Allow me to take this opportunity to extend my government's gratitude and appreciation to all co-sponsors, as well as the IMO Secretariat and other international organization for their support and contribution. Finally, colleagues, I believe this discussion will provide a platform for sharing knowledge and best practices with valuable takeaways for all of us. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your uh, kind opening. Uh, distinguished participant, I have been advised by the organizing committee that uh, Ambassador Dr. Tisra Prachaya might leave the event shortly due to another uh, engagement. And now I would like to invite our second speaker of the day, Ambassador Muhammad Koba, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Indonesia to the UN. He will uh, give presentation on lesson learned from the adoption of the UNG. Uh, UNGA resolution on seafarers. Before we begin, uh, kindly allow me to read shortly. Ambassador Koba is the Deputy Permanent Representative at the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Nations in New York. Previously, he was the Director of General Affairs Bureau at the MOFA. He was assigned in the Permanent Mission in Geneva and Permanent Mission to the European Union in Brussels in his early career. The floor is yours, Ambassador Koba. Um, thank you, moderator. Allow me at the outside to express my appreciation to Ambassador Desa Percaya and the Mission Embassy in London for having me 
in this important meeting this morning, this very early morning in New York. I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, to thank you, to thank our colleagues in the embassy in London, Pak Adam, Pak Riando, Burara, for their support and excellent cooperation with our team in New York uh, from the start of our initiative to draft the resolution as well as throughout the throughout the negotiation, all the way until finally uh, we could adopt the resolution. I would like to begin my presentation and Pak Riando will have me with this, with the sharing screen. I would like to begin by providing some background and also lesson learned from the process and adoption of the resolution, followed by the outlining of the significance of the resolution. I would like to begin by providing some background and also lesson learned from the process and adoption of the resolution, followed by the outlining of the significance of the resolution. I would like to begin by providing some background and also lesson learned from the process and adoption of the resolution, followed by the outlining of the significance of the resolution. I would like to begin by providing some background and also lesson I learned. Know, I think there will be prob from the a problem with the sound. Uh, we hear you all right, Ambassador Koba. Okay, because I was, you know, hearing myself uh, over and over again. Okay, first slide, Pando, please. Um, this initiative uh, comes as a result of concern on the challenges and situation faced by our seafarers in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, Pando. We have seen difficulties on crew changes. Uh, we have seen difficulties on crew changes, uh, repatriation, and also access to medical service as a result of the pandemic. I believe the other speakers will provide you with more comprehensive description on this issue. And there was also an intense communication with our embassy in London and in MOFA in Jakarta on how to raise this issue in New York. We are also working closely with the mission in New York, with IMO and ACTED to explore possibility of initiating the draft resolution in New York. And this is a historic uh, resolution. This is the first time the UNGA resolution that deals specifically on the protection of seafarers from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, one important consideration is the nature of the UN General Assembly which serve more as a political forum rather than technical forum. Any issues, including this one, will be seen from different angle, interest, and of course, there will be political consideration. Therefore, the challenge is to find the right connection to bring this issue to the attention of member countries. This is like, you know, as if the New Yorkers speak different language. Uh, but whenever we have a initiative from uh, other, uh, other city uh, from Geneva, from London, uh, we sort of have to calibrate it to to be uh, to sell it to New Yorkers. Uh, next slide, please. So, with this in mind, we managed to identify a strong connection between this pertinent issue and the ongoing attention in New York, which then serve as a basis to put forward our proposal. First and foremost. This issue is a prominent example of the impact of COVID-19. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the UNGA has greatly focused its attention to the COVID-19. There are a number of COVID-related resolutions, if I may put it that way, including the first one in which Indonesia initiated with five other countries in April this year. This resolution, resolution 74-270, among others, recognize and express its support to essential workers around the world. So this is our first group, essential workers. Secondly, this issue is in the heart of our current challenges, namely the impact of pandemic to the global economy. And shipping is undeniably the backbone of international trade and global supply chain, while seafarer is an integral part of this sector. Thirdly, there are already some calls to address the seafarer challenges. Uh, we have statements by the UN Secretary General in several occasions 
joint statement from UN agencies as well as some steps taken by related agencies, uh, notably, of course, by the IMO. And finally, uh, there's also recognition of the maritime sector's uh, role, a crucial role in the COVID-19 uh, response and recovery efforts, uh, which is transporting vital medical supplies, food, and other basic goods during the pandemic. Uh, during the process, uh, I must say that there are more similarities than differences among delegations. The issue has become a shared concern among countries, and there was a common agreement that this issue can only be addressed through our common efforts. Uh, next slide, please. With the consensus of adoption and 71 countries co-sponsoring the resolution, this initiative served as a united political commitment and created a political momentum to address the challenges faced by the seafarers, including the protection of the rights and well-being of the sea, uh, seafarers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the key takeaways. The first one would be the designation of seafarer and other marine personnel as key workers. Uh, uh, it urges it countries to implement protocols and take relevant measures. And uh, the resolution also requests the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, in collaboration with ILO, IMO, UNCTAD, and relevant entities to inform the UNGA on the development of this issue. This report. Uh, will equip member states with the needed knowledge base information and assist them in considering further the issue. Uh, next. Secondly, the resolution also underlined the need of uh, urgent and concrete response from all actors involved. Such situation can only be addressed through coordinated uh, approach and close cooperation between governments, international organizations, private sectors, and other relevant stakeholders. Uh, this is uh, this confirmed the need of international cooperation, and it serves as a basis for further cooperation and collaboration at the UN and on the ground at the regional and national levels to ensure the safety and well-being of seafarers as an important part of global supply chain. The resolution uh, provided platform for different agencies to work together. So, the, so what I'm trying to say is the protection of seafarer is part of uh, larger issues that need a comprehensive approach. The collaboration uh, between agencies, we have a more powerful impact in our, in our resolve to deal with the issue. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also uh, served as a game changer, if I may, on how we do things. And one thing for sure, Internal cooperation uh, is the only key to address the challenges and to adapt to the changing landscape of maritime issue. And finally, for us, for Indonesia, this resolution shows our commitment in the protection of our citizens abroad. It is a proof of synergy in all levels and forums, uh, bilaterals and uh, multilateral forums. Next, please. So, what's next? Uh, the reason is not an end it's in itself. It is the beginning of our common efforts. Uh, first, the political commitment on the prote protection of seafarers need to be translated into concrete terms. Countries need to ensure the necessary measures uh, as has been outlined by the resolution. These conventions um, serve as a legal basis for Indonesia uh, and also other countries to ensure the protection of seafarers, including in its cooperation with other countries and other stakeholders. And at the same time, countries need to establish procedures to support the seafarers in its territory, taking into account the essential uh, preventive measures against the COVID-19. Uh, the report will be, that will be presented uh, to the member state by the IMO and UNCTAD as well as the agency next year, uh, we'll provide a, hopefully we'll provide a clearer picture 
on the implementation of this resolution. Uh, how countries and uh, other stakeholders implement the necessary measures in the protection of, of the seafarers. Uh, while it is important for maritime transport to adapt to new normal, it is also necessary to consider ways to improve maritime governance. Uh, we need to find creative way to adapt to uh, new normal, uh, for example, uh, increasing the use of new technologies and uh, digitalization. Uh, last point is that uh, governments, uh, UN agencies, private sectors, and other stakeholders need to develop coordinated response and coordinated actions to answer the resilience of global supply chains, not only in the midst of current pandemic, but also future challenges that might disrupt global industries and affect seafarers. Thank you. With that, I conclude the, my presentation. Thank you, Ambassador Koba, for your presentation. And now I would like to invite our third speaker, Ms. Katie Ware, Director of UK Maritime Services from the UK Department of Transport and Permanent Representative of the UK to the IMO. I think Ms. Katie is already with us. Eh? Uh, Good morning, distinguished morning. colleagues. It's an honor, as always, to be invited by our very dear friends at the Indonesian Embassy in London. Um, we sincerely hope that everybody on the call is keeping well and safe, and as your families are also well and safe. It's difficult and challenging times, and we miss our IMO colleagues very, very much. Um, first of all, we would just like to express our sincere appreciation to Indonesia and all the co-sponsors in respect of the United Nations General Assembly resolution. This is a real milestone for all of us, and we were very privileged to be able to work with colleagues to sponsor the, the resolution and also support it at the General Assembly. As the world has faced COVID-19 pandemic this year, collective international efforts have rightly prioritized the continued functioning of global support chains to ensure the resilience of our national economies. Seafarers have been on the front line of those efforts. They are the key workers responsible for the safe and efficient operation of the maritime transport system, which moves over 80% of global trade. Seafarers and those operating their ships have faced unprecedented challenges posed by the pandemic in particular, as restrictions have hindered their ability to conduct ship crew changes, to return home and to access medical care and assistance. Seafarers are the lifeblood of the world's economy. And as a coastal port and flag state, the UK recognised the critical position that seafarers hold in both the UK and the global economy. More than ever, we need to ensure that freight is able to flow inwards and outwards of the country and that global trade continues for the benefit of all citizens and the economy. We do also recognise and appreciate that governments will want to protect their domestic population, but the crisis being endured by seafarers cannot be permitted to continue. It does not matter if a state is a net importer or exporter Every state relies on seafarers for the delivery of vital goods and services. For the sake of the seafarers' physical and mental welfare, for their families, for the protection of the marine environment, and for the protection of the global economy and supply chains, we in the UK would like to see much more action. And then with that, I would just I would just talk you through some of the leadership that the UK has taken in this area. Um, from my side, just because obviously I'm the director of UK Maritime Services, I'm responsible for the port and flag state function of the UK Maritime Administration, and that we are based at the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, which is an arm's length body of the Department for Transport. Myself, my teams, we fundamentally believe that the right to wages, shore leave, sick leave, access to medical care, food supplies, 
and repatriation is a fundamental right of all seafarers. And that is why in the UK, we were one of the first to designate seafarers as key workers. But I'd just like to talk you through just very briefly what we do at a practical level here in the UK. And I'll talk to you from a port state control perspective and also from a flag state perspective. Um, and I would also just like to give acknowledgement to the Seafarers Crisis Action Team at the IMO. And key to us is any information that we receive from that team. And a case, an example, was the um, CMV cruise ships, um, obviously, that we worked very closely with the Indonesian embassy on. And I'm very pleased to say that those ships, the crews have been repaid and repatriated, and those ships have now left the UK. But how do we go about it in port state control? It's a really fine balance, a really fine balance, because we need to go on board the vessels. We need to do port state control inspection. But we're also really mindful that we don't expose seafarers unnecessarily or equally that I expose my port state control officers. So what we do in the UK is if we receive a complaint of um, a lack of wages or that uh, seafarers employment agreements have uh, expired, we will, as a matter of principle, always go and board those vessels as safely as we can to undertake um, inspections. Um, with respect to other port state control, we do risk assess all vessels that are coming into the UK. We monitor where they've been. So, for example, if a vessel has been deep sea for 14 days or over 14 days, we can be pretty sure that that vessel is COVID safe. However, if there is a vessel that has been hopping around the coast of um, Northern Europe, we can be somewhat a little bit more cautious in our, whether we attend the vessel or not. So as a key point, uh, well, obviously we are inspecting them under all conventions, but obviously we do a look at the MLC very strictly. And we're under no illusion, we will detain vessels if we find that there are significant breaches of the MLC. Um, in terms of not being not spreading the um, the COVID, we work very closely with our port health authorities to assess the risks and the situations on board. And here in the UK, we will always make sure uh, that seafarers have the right to medical assistance ashore. Um, that is a fundamental principle that we believe in the UK that seafarers should be entitled to. So we work very closely with Public Health England and our port authorities, port health authorities, just to keep keep on top of the, the, the spreading of the virus and don't take any unnecessary risks. And um, for example, here in Southampton, we've got a large number of cruise ships. When we do crew changes, in order to protect those crew on those cruise ships, um, if a seafarer arrives in the UK and they are showing positive, we have arrangements in place with local hotels where we can isolate those seafarers before we allow them to go back onto the ships. Um, so we have means in place of controlling all of that. But I would also say that um, we don't just focus on port state control in the UK. We also focus on our own flagged vessels. And particularly for us in the UK, um, we've got a large number of fishing vessels. And we are mindful that there is a substantial amount of Indonesian crew on some of our very large fishing vessels. So we are actively monitoring and doing welfare checks on our fishing vessels just to make sure that the crews are within this seafarers employment agreements, that they are being paid, that they are getting access to uh, wages, to sick leave, um, medical care, food supplies, etc. And again, I am not afraid to uh, detain my own vessels if I need to, and there is significant welfare breaches on board. The other point that I would like to touch on very briefly um, before I conclude is the issue of um, seafarers employment agreements and the position we in the UK take both from a port state control perspective and um, a flag state perspective um, and we take this matter very very seriously but we haven't taken a blanket approach in when a seafarers employment agreement has expired they are up to their 11 months minus plus their one month we will consider seafarers on an individual basis um, we don't take a blanket approach we believe that just taking a blanket approach and stopping vessels can actually be more stressful 
for the seafarers because if they are stopped in a port where they can't be repatriated, it actually causes more anxiety. So what we do in the UK is we assess each individual application on a case-by-case -case basis uh, where the ship has had frustrations in being able to organise repatriation. We will give up to 30 days extension whilst they... Um, can organise for other repatriation, mindful that an awful lot of ships are having to be diverted. Um, we would also, if a seafarer requests to stay on board, we would extend for a reasonable period of time. And often what you find is, again, this is to support the welfare of the seafarers. It causes them a huge anxiety if they have to be repatriated in a country where there's a really high rate of COVID um, infection. So again, if a seafarer asks to stay on for a period of time so that they don't have to transit through high risk areas, then we will obviously allow that and consider it. Um, but we also, as a flag, we require all of our operators to notify us of any seafarers employment agreements that are beyond the 30 day limit. So that's a little bit of an insight of what we in the UK are doing um, from a practical point of view as a flag state and a port state. It's quite a run through all of that and I'm obviously happy to take any questions. But with that, I will pause and obviously hand over back to the moderator. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Kitty Weir. Um, I apologize that I didn't have a chance to uh, introduce you to the, 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 the participants here. Uh, may, may I now <laughs> uh, just short CV that we uh, obtained from the, <laughs> from, the, from the UK Transport Department. Ms. Katie Weir was appointed as the Director of UK Maritime Services uh, in April 2016. She studied marine technology at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, where she graduated with honors degree in marine technology. From 2011, uh, Ms. Katie Weir was appointed as the permanent representative of the UK to the International Maritime Organization. Her role was to facilitate, coordinate, and negotiate all maritime, uh, all maritime matters between other governmental departments, the European Union, and the IMO. And Ms. Ketiwer currently retains this status. Thank you, Ms. Ketiwer, for your presentation. And now we arrive to our fourth uh, speaker from Jakarta, Mr. Yuda Nugraha. Director for the Protection of Citizens and Legal Entities Overseas, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Pak Yuda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wina, as our moderator today. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you clearly, Pak. Uh, please allow me to read also your short uh, CV for the participants. Oh. Mr. Yudan Graha is a career diplomat. At the beginning of his career, he handled international trade negotiation issues and was assigned to the permanent mission in Geneva. His second assignment was to the Indonesian embassy, uh, embassy in Kuala Lumpur, where he got acquainted with citizen protection issues. The floor is yours, Pak Yuda. Thank you, Ms. Mina, for introducing me. Uh, very good morning. Uh, His Excellency, Ambassador Desta Pichaya, his Excellency Ambassador uh, Mohamed Koba, Ms. Katie Ware, uh, Permanent Representative of the UK to the AMO, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure for us uh, to be able to join this webinar as because of its uh, significance to Indonesia on the protection of a uh, seafarer. Uh, I would like also to use this opportunity to express our appreciation to all stakeholders that have uh, contributed and supported the adoption of UNGA resolution on the CFR during uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. <clears throat> My special thanks also goes to uh, our colleague in the uh, Indonesian Embassy in London, as well as uh, Indonesian Permanent Mission in New York. Uh, uh, allow me to share a short presentation. I would like to begin my presentation uh, by giving you all the picture how 
significant or how important uh, the UNGA resolution for Indonesia. This is the, the, the maritime profile of Indonesia, the coast uh, per area ratio of Indonesia, uh, 52.5 meter per square kilometers. The number of uh, seafarer, according to UNCTED database, uh, more than uh, 143,000. And the number of fleet, uh, Indonesian vessel, with uh, our national flag, uh, more than uh, uh, 9,000 ships. And the number of uh, pole ports, uh, more than uh, 175,000. And uh, this is the number of uh, seafarer, according to our national data, uh, more than 1.1 million uh, Indonesia, according to uh, our database, uh, reduced by uh, Ministry of Transport uh, with regard to the cement book uh, as uh, produced for, for Indonesian seafarer. So more than 1.1 1. 1, uh, million seafarer working uh, both uh, domestically and also overseas. And uh, what sale, according to UNCTED database, uh, the number of uh, the, the percentage of officers, according to uh, the total number of seafarers uh, in the world, is 6.62%. Uh, uh, and for the ratings, 10.59%. Uh, and this is uh, how important about the protection of uh, Indonesian seafarer for us, according to our database. Uh, the number of sorry, the number of seafarer uh, cases uh, we handle uh, per year around uh, 100 is quite uh, increase in 2017, uh, 320, and then decrease in 18. Uh, we would expect that the number of uh, cases of uh, seafarer during the COVID-19 is also increasing. Uh, in this regard, we also uh, would like to to uh, give the picture about the fisher, not only the seafarer, but also the fisher of Indonesia working in the fishing uh, fleet uh, overseas. The number is, is increasing over year. It's also uh, give uh, us a very con concern us about, about the, the, the increasing number of uh, cases faced by our fisher. And this is uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation faced by Indonesian civil offices. Uh, according to uh, our database, uh, when the COVID-19 uh, started uh, early uh, this year, the, the number of uh, vessel uh, where our seafarer are working on, on board, they are uh, uh, located in uh, 38 countries within territorial waters and also international waters. And uh, with regard to the COVID-19, uh, there are two types, uh, which is uh, directly impacted by COVID-19, which is uh, impacted by COVID-19. Up until yesterday, there are 185 seafarer on board on, in uh, 29 vessels that have been infected by COVID-19. And for the repatriation, this is an uh, indirect impact of the COVID-19, especially uh, our seafarer working in the cruise uh, vessel. Up until uh, yesterday, uh, there are 26,783 our seafarer have been uh, returned home. This is a massive uh, repatriation uh, and uh, we coordinated uh, closely with our mission offices as well as the owner and the, the ship operator. And this is the challenges we face when we are dealing with the repatriation of our uh, Indonesian uh, seafarer during the COVID-19. Uh, the first problem is the suspension of transport transportation modes, particularly international flight. Uh, as we are all aware that uh, during early, uh, early phase of uh, the COVID-19, many international, international flight has been uh, canceled. And also many countries also closed their borders port and as well as airport. Uh, the, the third problem is the unavailability of replacement crews. And the fourth problem uh, is operator and owner vessel have financial difficulties. Uh, for example, we have now uh, still handle cases where our seafarer uh, working in the Middle East country 
cannot be repatriated because the uh, owner have uh, financial difficulties and uh, also uh, having difficulties to find replacement food. So the result of these challenges, the seafarer have to stay longer on board, more than 11 months, and this uh, cause uh, fatigue and also health issue. For our uh, seafarer working in the cruise uh, ship, uh, uh, for example, the challenges facing uh, by our seafarer uh, related to health issue, uh, one of our seafarer have committed suicide. Yeah, committed suicide because of the uh, fatigue and uh, and uh, mental health faced by by them uh, when because they have to stay longer on board. And the UN resolution on seafare and crew chains, uh, uh, as we are all aware that uh, it is true that uh, the the important of UNGA resolution is to uh, ensure that uh, the global uh, trade. Uh, which is more than 80% uh, using the, the vessel uh, is, is not impacted by uh, COVID-19. But we also want to touch upon the humanity aspect, the welfare of the seafarer, uh, which is provide decent working condition. Uh, and this way that we uh, do uh, agree that uh, the UN resolution uh, also touch upon the, the hours of work of rest uh, payment of wages, repatriation at the end of contract, onboard medical care, health and safety protection, and accident prevention, as well as the right for timely repatriation. This is according to the MLC. And uh, with regard uh, to the way forward, this is my last uh, presentation. Uh, we would like to divide uh, the the way forward uh, first for Indonesia and, well, and as well as for national cooperation. For us, uh, in our part, uh, we would like to build uh, national data with regard to single national data on migration issue, including uh, CFR offices. We also strengthening our national regulation, uh, aiming at streamlining migration process as, uh, so, so as to pro uh, provide better protection for our CFR as well as uh, fiscal and also increase international capacity to respond. This is cooperation between uh, ministry in Indonesia and agency to provide services for CIFER. With regard uh, to uh, international uh, fora, uh, we would like to, uh, to also propose that uh, the UNGA resolution uh, could also uh, extend it uh, to provide protection for visa. Uh, as we are aware that uh, FISA also mentioned uh, uh, within the UNGA resolution and uh, because of we, we do uh, understand that the IMO uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, discuss uh, about, about the FISA but uh, with regard to uh, the importance of uh, FISA because the FISA also affect by, are affected by the uh, COVID-19 so we would like uh, to encourage also uh, uh, protection uh, for for seafarer uh, also in extended for visa, and then uh, international cooperation. Of course, the the as uh, Ambassador Muhammad Koba have mentioned earlier that uh, the NGA resolution is a political commitment. The the most important thing is how to translate the resolution into concrete action, especially cooperation between flag and port state, as well as the sending countries of the seafarer. Uh, in this regard, Indonesia stand ready uh, to cooperate closely with the flag state and also port state uh, for crew chains, as well as to repatriate our Indonesian seafarer to Indonesia. And uh, maybe our, our, uh, our uh, colleague from Ministry of uh, Transportation uh, will uh, also explain in detail about the readiness of Indonesia to also facilitate the cruise chains within Indonesian uh, territorial water. Uh, with this, and uh, with this uh, slide, uh, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Yuda, for your presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Yan Debur. Uh, he will be. Uh, he will deliver a presentation on IMO's perspective 
uh, how states could utilize international instruments on seafarers' crew change. Allow me, Mr. Uh, Debur, to uh, present your short, uh, uh, short CV. Yeah. Mr. Yan Debur is Senior Legal Officer at the Legal Affairs and External Relations Division of the IMO. He is also a member of the IMO Seafarer Crisis Action Team, which was established in April 2020 by the IMO Secretary General in response to the growing concern over the crew change crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemics. As a vice chairman of the IMO Legal Committee, he was involved in numerous international conventions and attended many diplomatic conferences. In 2007, he was elected as chairman of the Committee of the Whole of the successful IMO International Conference on the Removal of Wrecks in Nairobi, Kenya. Mr. Yandabur, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wina. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted actually today uh, to be amongst uh, so many uh, distinguished excellencies uh, participants, uh, because today it's uh, the United Nations uh, Roman uh, Rights Day. And I hope that we can uh, yeah, celebrate and uh, also uh, yeah, uh, give due regard uh, to the human rights uh, to seafarers. The IMO theme for today is actually to stand up for uh, stranded seafarers. So what could be more appropriate today than uh, to have a webinar actually uh, addressing uh, those concerns? And uh, I think I should also congratulate Indonesia with the very uh, successful uh, adoption of the General Assembly uh, resolution uh, last week, uh, which was co-sponsored by 71 uh, co-sponsors uh, de delegation. So that is a very good result and actually it gives good hope uh, because we are not yet at the ending uh, of where we are today with the whole crew change uh, crisis. I will uh, give my presentation. I hope I will do uh, now the right thing how uh, sharing it because uh, what I see in front of me is not uh, sharing. So I have to perhaps enlarge this. Uh, oof, uh, it doesn't show a few full screen. This screen is not showing now. Yeah, it does. So I hope that uh, you all have a uh, blue screen in front of you. Uh, as Ms. Wina explained, my presentation will about uh, how states could utilize international instruments on the seafarers crew change. And actually, uh, I want to highlight uh, also the work that uh, IMO is doing even without having rules, but uh, let's see how rules are being established uh, in, in that sense. Um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact uh, on the sea uh, faring uh, community and also the industry. Uh, at present, uh, there are still 400,000 seafarers uh, affected uh, worldwide who actually want to be transported from the ships. And uh, a similar number is actually uh, about those seafarers who want actually to have access to, to their ships. Uh, because there are so many travel restrictions uh, through ports, airports, uh, by inland, and that means that thousands and thousands of seafarers cannot leave their ships, uh, cannot be repatriated at home, uh, cannot have crew changes, and in some instances, as we will see, uh, also have not direct access to, to medical assistance. So uh, it's, it's a true crisis. Many seafarers have this year uh, seen their contracts unilaterally being terminated. Uh, have been quarantined uh, on board and shore, and often more than, than the 14 days that, that we ourselves are, are uh, used to, and also without getting uh, paid in many uh, instances. The uh, 
COVID-19 has also a tremendous uh, effect on the spike in cases uh, of abandoned seafarers. We have seen uh, last week in the legal committee that about uh, 65 new cases uh, this year have been reported. And I can reveal to you it will be many more because we still receive uh, really dozens of, of new abandonment cases. So uh, that fact is also exacerbating the uh, coup change situation. As I said, uh, also about 400,000 uh, of seafarers are having difficulty uh, to join ships. So altogether, we have about 800,000 uh, seafarers, uh, the numbers that we receive, that do face difficulties. Of course, there are also solutions uh, underway, and I will show you later on some figures on that. But the uh, whole crisis has resulted uh, yeah, in, in a crisis that uh, has three dimensions, in the words of our Secretary General, Mr. Kitaklin. That it is a humanitarian crisis for the seafarers individually. It has safety concerns because uh, seafarers too long on ships, uh, even uh, yeah, in, in some cases expanding for, for one year uh, their contracts has, of course, uh, consequences for safety. And of course, uh, the whole global uh, supply chain uh, is, is uh, being compromised. So from the start, uh, IMO, because we cannot do it uh, all ourselves, uh, and IMO uh, is actually also all the uh, participating uh, member states. We all um, uh, share this and we have to work hard. We do that tirelessly. Also together with the other involved international organizations, the ILO, the WHO, ICAO, and also the NGOs, ITF, ICS, and the International Maritime Health Association. They all do a tremendous job actually to get things solved for the poor seafarers. In the start of the... Uh, a crisis. We were faced with situation, and, and my good friend uh, uh, Basilio Araujo sent me these pictures. Actually, when there was a successful evacuation, a medical evacuation taken care of in the Strait of Malacca by by Indonesia. So you can see uh, by cooperation, we actually were in the start of the crisis able uh, to uh, yeah to to assist seafarers that really needed uh, med medical assistance. Why it's so important uh, to have uh, unified standards? I will explain that very uh, shortly by, uh, yeah, it was said, 90% of global trade is actually being performed by ships. Those ships all have uh, different uh, owners, um, different management chains in different countries. So uh, there are many jurisdictions involved uh, with ships. They spend their lives in many jurisdictions. They have their economic connections with other jurisdictions. And they are that way also far from uh, their states of registry. So there is a real need to have international standards. And that also counts for where we are with the whole crew change uh, crisis. Well, IMO is the specialized agency for the safety and security of shipping and the prevention of marine pollution by ships. It's the only UN agency headquartered in London and has a relatively low budget uh, and also a low staff number. And that's all because the philosophy is the IMO is the membership of the uh, member states the secretariat is facilitating that work, but it has really to be uh, yeah, on operation level to be enforced. And that's why it's so important uh, also for the crew change to have some uh, means facilitating that. There are some 15 nationalities represented uh, in the staff. This is a truly uh, multicultural uh, organization. And as said, there are 174 member states and all have some maritime interests. Otherwise, they would not qualify to become an IMO member state. Well, from the start uh, of the crisis, IMO uh, has actually uh, promulgated protocols that were actually from the first start being um, established by, by industry and, and the NGOs, the seafarers. 
to, uh, to urge member states to designate seafarers as key workers, regardless of nationality, whenever they are in the jurisdiction of, of member states and providing an assistance service. So from the start, actually, without uh, these rules uh, being possible to formally adopt in the context of IMO, we were working already on the basis of uh, these concepts, also in the work of SCAT, and actually to address states that this is really needed to alleviate the crisis. So also uh, accompanying those uh, designation of seafarers was to uh, urge states that professional seafarers and marine personnel are actually exempted from national travel and movement restrictions, uh, which would facilitate the, them joining or leaving ships, quite crucial. And all these uh, statements in these protocols were actually uh, recommended by the Secretary General. So he uh, was actually frank, promulgating to the member states what needed to be done when uh, there was no possibility actually for IMO to have uh, formal meetings. And that was built up later in the year. And actually we established in the end uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the needed provisions uh, to, to be implemented. So first we had the circular letters in the food to four series. Then uh, when there was the uh, Alcom uh, meeting, uh, the Maritime Safety Commission uh, resolution was adopted to recommend action to facilitate ship cruise change, have access to medical care and seafair travel uh, during the pandemic. Uh, that was an informal uh, Maritime Safety Committee. So this was formalized in the Maritime Safety Committee in uh, October through the Maritime Safety uh, uh, Resolution, uh, and which was then actually being formalized by way of uh, making that uh, yeah, part of the formal work of uh, the Maritime Safety Committee by having a circular letter which is actually acknowledged by uh, the Maritime Safety Committee and actually uh, is now on the 2nd of December being promulgated. Um, and what is, of course, very important is that uh, in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution, which was pr uh, proposed by uh, Indonesia, uh, the Republic of Indonesia with 51 uh, co-sponders, uh, is a very good uh, result and means actually to outreach all this work what started up uh, with having no rules, now having rules and actually uh, having them on the highest level being assessed. And I think that's quite successful uh, to have from the highest level uh, the uh, yeah, urgency be, being recognized at member states yeah, uh, sh should designate seafarers and other marine personnel as key workers. This is really key for, for the whole work. It has been from the start. Actually, I dealing myself on a daily basis with these two uh, issues, uh, having seafarers being designated as key workers and also being exempted from, from the several um, impediments. It's so crucial actually to get resolutions uh, being accepted for the whole membership. So what we see by this uh, work in SCAT, the effective uh, diplomatic invention leads to results. People uh, with medical issues, we get them out of uh, their uh, difficult situations and, and get them repatriated. And, and actually also the same is happening with uh, crew changes and, and people uh, yeah, in, in medical situation, of course, have a priority. We immediately take action when we note of uh, yeah, such circumstances. Yeah, let me see, uh, show you where we are at the moment. Uh, uh, this is uh, some um, indication of uh, how the protocols and resolution have an effect. What we see is uh, that uh, by a survey that was done in, in October, uh, that we see that in, uh, yeah, in, in the uh, Asian, uh, you see about uh, on the total um, contribution to crew changes, 11% uh, uh, is actually uh, successful crew change in, in Asia and the Pacific, and five is not. So two thirds of uh, crew changes uh, do happen, uh, are performed. 
in Europe is quite uh, an, another uh, proportionality it has to do with uh, that there are many hubs in, uh, in in Europe that can be used. Uh, and you see in other parts of the, the world, uh, it's more even that there are yeah, successful and unsuccessful uh, crew changes. Important uh, are about this slide, uh, this, this uh, graph shows that there are about 700,000 uh, seafarers are due to travel. Well, I can reveal this is uh, the status at 15 October. Now it's been said by Intermanager that, that there are 100,000 more. What, so this uh, red uh, line is actually still steeping and that, that's worrying us and that's why it's so necessary to continue with our efforts to take action. Meanwhile, we also see that about 100,000 uh, of this uh, 800,000 are being uh, yeah, crew changed. So uh, that's hopeful, but this line has to steep up. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, this cannot continue, and and we uh, yeah need to be aware that the issue is uh, not not solved yet. Uh, so still a critical situation, and we need uh, to endeavor our uh, efforts. So IMO is encouraged uh, by the progress made. Uh, to have uh, the seafarers being designated as key workers and that crew chain that facilitate crew changes and, and repatriations. Uh, I'm always also very concerned about the many kinds of restrictions are still in place. And we have to make them aware that uh, yeah, seafarers are like other essential workers. Uh, yeah, people who have uh, should not be have this all these impediments. So uh, we are not there yet. Uh, there is some hope that we're still on the verge of, of a humanitarian crisis. And I can uh, reveal to you on my desk, I have uh, each and every day, many and many uh, yeah, uh, cries from seafarers, the families to actually to, to get assistance. And we try really to do our best to, to render that. On top of that, yeah, the seafarers are too long on board the ships. Uh, and it is yeah, actually the responsibility of the governments to ensure that ships uh, can continue moving and uh, enable the world to overcome and recover from also the uh, global effects economically. So the seafarer crisis action team is not just myself. I have two very dedicated uh, colleagues. We work together. And we're dealing with contacting representatives from the national governments, from the NGOs, ICS, ITF, uh, IMHA, uh, the trade unions and relevant associations. And we try actually to solve uh, these issues to, to, to a solution. And uh, not the least, we also very closely uh, are connected with the International Labour Organization because the Maritime Labour Convention is within the remits of, of ILO, but uh, this crisis is overarching all these, these competences. Um, so seafarers and their relatives can contact uh, the SCAT directly by uh, the uh, IMO info um, email address. And actually, I think this in a nutshell, what we uh, yeah, try to do and, and have a focus also with the regulations. We have now become somewhat more formalized into the direction of, uh, of proper solutions, but we need to have this uh, sharp on our focus. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wiener, our moderator. Thank you, Mr. De Boer, for your presentation. Uh, as we're heading to the last speaker, I would like to uh, inform all participants, should you have any questions, please write your name and your institution in the chat feature so it will be easier for the committee to call you uh, accordingly. You can start uh, writing your name and your institution in the chat feature, should you have any questions. And then now uh, we have arrived to our last speaker. I would, uh, let's welcome uh, Captain Anthony Arif, Director for Sea Traffic and Transport, Indonesia's national vo uh, focal on crew change and repatriation of seafarers, Ministry of Transportation of the Republic of Indonesia. 
uh, Captain Anthony Arif will deliver presentation on Indonesia's commitment on facilitating repatriation of seafarers and way forward post the UNGA resolution. Captain Anthony, may I uh, read your CV briefly? Captain Anthony Arif earned his doctorate from the University of Indonesia and University of Le Havre in France. His research was on the safety assessment on draw on draw of ferry before, appoint, before appointed as the director for sea traffic and transport. Captain Anthony was the district head of navigation in Tanjung Priok port. And before that, he was a transportation attache at the Indonesian embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Captain Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Winar Nosari. May uh, I ask my voice is clear there? Yes, we can hear you clearly, Captain Anthony. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I start to share my screen? Yeah, before that, uh, His Excellency Dr. Desa Percaya, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia, distinguished all the panelists in this talk, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good day to everyone. Uh, of course, first of all, I need to introduce myself. My name is uh, Anthony Arif Piadi, as the moderator uh, introduced on the beginning. And currently uh, serving as director of for sea traffic and transportation, Ministry of Transport of the Republic of Indonesia, and also as the Indonesian national focal point on crew changes and reputation of seafarers. Uh, I am delighted to join this important webinar. Despite the current global pandemic, we are all encountering. Our highest appreciation to all medical and health personnel who have been tirelessly and bravely standing in the front line to combat this pandemic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Indonesia must realize the important and crucial things as stated in this talk background that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic continue to affect the world economy, particularly the functioning of the global supply chains and the flow of essential goods and services. Global shipping has been particularly hit hard by the pandemic and restriction and its role in transporting more than 80% of world trade has been disrupted. Seafarers are an important component as there are approximately 2 million seafarers who work on fleet of more than uh, 98,000 commercial ships transporting more than 11 billion tons of seaborne trade based on the uh, data 2019. Despite their crucial roles, seafarers are often overlooked and a crisis concerning seafarers' crew changes during the pandemic has come to the fore. As the information, it has been estimated that more than 400,000 seafarers require immediate repatriation, with many more serving on extended crew contract and being offered due to return home. And that a similar number of seafarers urgently need to join ship to replace them. In addition, it seems that many ship owners have reduced operational activity and some have even declared bankruptcy and other problems due to fatigue and stress experienced by seafarers. Up to date, uh, we still receive complaints from the seafarers who ask for the reputation direct to my WhatsApp, my email, and so on. Uh, wait a moment. The global pandemic of COVID-19 is indeed an update 
unprecedented and one of a kind situation that uh, we all have to endure. COVID-19 poses great challenges and difficulties for the global world. Therefore, the issue of reputation and crew changes has become a global one and immediate effort to tackle this crisis is needed. Indonesia expresses its deepest appreciation and gratitude to the country that agreed to importance of seafarers protection and crew change in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The United Nations UN General Assembly session passed a resolution on cooperation between countries in protecting seafarers in the midst of the pandemics by consensus on the Tuesday, 1st uh, December. Through a statement, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia said that the contents of the resolution contain requests for the country the designated seafarers as key workers or important sector workers, implement provision concerning seafarers, safety, including change of crew members, and encourage cooperation of all parties to facilitate travel, repatriation, as well as access to all services for passengers. This initiate resolution has been sponsored by 71 UN member country and is the first resolution concerning seafarers and the management of a flow of goods globally. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia thanks IMO Secretariat and ILO for providing information on document 107 slash 10 slash 1 and 107 slash 10 slash 2. Father, Indonesia appreciate the work of SCAT, Seafarers Crisis Action Team, that was formed by the Secretary General to address the challenges for crew change during the pandemic that attached great importance to conduct certain specific measures taken by the maritime administration. We believe that sea transportation plays an important role for the world economy and designed the Senate seafarers as key workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the protocol for ensuring safe ship crew change and travel is a paramount. As one of the country with the largest number of seafarers in the world, Indonesia is committed to take necessary action to facilitate face seafarers issues at the first place, such, such as ship crew change and seafarer travel. This measure is taken not only to ensure the safety and well-being of the seafarers, but also to ensure normal flow of international trade. Indonesia has issued a circulator director general of sea transportation and stipulate in recent standard operation procedure SOP on national framework for the replacement and repatriation of ship crew and port services during COVID-19 pandemics. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the circular provides the procedure for administrator, harbor master, ship owner or operator, or and ship crew in exercising crew change and repatriation and for port services in Indonesia. In the circular, there are 11 ports are designated open for crew change and repatriation in Indonesia, namely Pelawan on the west part, Tanjung Bali Karimun, Batam, Mera, Tanjung Priok, Tanjung Perak, Asar, Benoa, Sorong, Ambon, and Bitung. Integrated services include the information of pre-ship arrival, arrival, deprecation or embarkation, CIQS process, medical examination of COVID-19, places for COVID, places for current uh, COVID-19 quarantine or, or isolation, land transportation and connected flight home. Currently, there are no restrictions on type of vessel for crew change. Uh, standard operational procedure for the replacement or repatriation of ship crew, such as for the captain and crew, they are required to comply with the applicable regulation and standard provision on COVID-19 protocol. Then ship owner, operator, they have uh, obligation, manage foreign ship agency approval, manage foreign uh, ship agency approval, so a commitment letter from the ship owner or principal. 
facilitating and covering the cost of crew travel in change return, return from and or to ships and others party that related to the uh, procedure for the repatriation of the uh, seafarers. <clears throat> related to provision financial security in case uh, abandonment of seafarers and ship owner responsibility in respect of contractual claim for personal injury to or death of seafarers in light of the progress of the progress of amendment to the ILO Maritime Law Convention 2006, we would like to inform several things besides the DGST, SQL, and established SOP that in terms of provision of data, several abandonment cases can be channeled through a complaint to email kepelautan at in accordance with the creation of MLC Part 2 made by the company referring to national regulation contained in the creation of MLC Part 1. With regard, of, with regard to MLC certificate, that the provision financial security for seafarers is one of the main conditions that being mandatory for ship that sail overseas in approving the collective bargaining agreement or CBA between the company as the employer and the seafarer association such financial security is a condition for our administration to issue the CBA. Therefore, Indonesia support the effort made by AMO and ILO in establishing this joint database for abandonment of seafarers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, since COVID-19 poses great challenges and difficulties for the global world on this occasion, Indonesia really hope that country to design, design it seafarers as the key workers, implement the IMO protocol regarding crew changes, travel of seafarers and repartition and access of the service. International organization and relevant stakeholder to assist the government formulating and implementing policies and responses to ensure global supply. And the last one, there will be cooperation between the Secretary General of the United Nations and IMO, ILO and, and UN CTA. <clears throat> and then uh, the last, what I may uh, say something that the problem currently happened for the seafarers is actually a lot of company, they keep silent of the uh, crew condition on board. Therefore, I advise that actually government should uh, uh, identify the ship under their flags, uh, how many uh, seafarers, foreign seafarers on the, their ship and so on, and asking uh, how they manage uh, the reputation. Uh, indeed, that uh, a lot of seafarers right now, the government know how to uh, repatriate it and so on, they facilitate, but a lot of company, they still keep silence and they uh, normally wait and see uh, extend the contract and then the, a lot of things that uh, they keep the crew on board because uh, two things they have difficulty to repatriate and uh, looking for the uh, relief thank you the moderators time is yours terima kasih uh, apologies thank you uh, captain anthony for your uh, presentation and now uh, we would like to open uh, the question and answer session. Do we have any question from the floor? Is there any question? Do we see any question from the floor? Oh. Yeah, we have a question from Miss Rara from Indonesian Embassy in London. Please, uh, Miss Rara. Thank you, Mbak Wina, uh, um, uh, Miss Moderator. I would like to pose a, a, a question, technical question, actually, to um, particularly to uh, um, uh, Miss uh, Katie Ware and um, uh, Pat pa Yuda and uh, Pa Antoni, probably, because it, it has something to do with the um, uh, database. Um, we heard uh, we 
but uh, that Pak Yuda previously mentioned about the database of the C virus, I would like actually to um, um, hear more of your uh, um, point of view about to what extent a country could monitor uh, its seafarers, including its placement to the um, vessels, because um, in this case, we understand that the um, contractual uh, contractual um, the working contract uh, between the seafarers and the and then and the ship is actually the um, private matters between the um, uh, seafarers and the company. So I would like to hear um, more about that. Whether whether a country could um, have the um, like national mechanism or database to uh, provide the better better uh, control and monitoring. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rara. Uh, may I know uh, who the question was addressed to? Is it to Indonesian government or you would like to know the, the best practice from the UK or uh, the, from the IMO? Uh, thank you, Ms. Wina. Uh, I think I would like to hear uh, the best practice from the UK and then the um, point of you uh, of the possibility for uh, the government of Indonesia to have the um, mechanism from uh, Pak Yuda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we would like to give the chance uh, to uh, to UK first to Miss Kepi Waria. Thank you and so. thank you, Rara. It's a really valid question. So we don't have any formal mechanism in the UK, but what we do um, on a regular basis, and we've done it since the beginning of the pandemic, is we contact all of our ship operators. We ask them how many crew they've got on board, what the nationalities are, and when they are due, their SEAs are due to expire. So we keep um, keep that database. It is voluntary, but it gives us a very good idea of what nationalities we've got on and when they are likely to require to do crew changes. Um, as I say, it's a voluntary basis, but it is... Um, we find that our operators are very willing to comply because they know that we will step in to try and help them with the repatriation. So we monitor that, we review it every couple of months. Um, and as I said earlier, we require all of our ship operators to let us know when an SEA has gone over its 30 days. Um, and just to give you a feeling for that, we also have the database of the days on board for our uh, four seafarers that have gone over the 12 months. Um, so just for an example at the moment, we currently have 195 seafarers on UK vessels that have gone over their 11 month period. Um, and we've actually managed to repatriate 59 of those this month. So it is a voluntary basis. Um, we really, we just write to our operators. We ask them to engage with us. We ask them to provide us the stats and figures and we encourage them that really the only reason that we want it is to try and help them to plan and facilitate uh, their crew changes. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kathy Weir. And now uh, we would like to give the opportunity to Mr. Yudha Nugraha to respond to the question. Thank you, thank you, Miss Miss Sarah, for your uh, important question. I think this is the the biggest challenges, if I say, uh, when we try to repatriate more than twenty six thousand of Indonesian seafarers, especially working in the cruise vessel. So at the time when we are trying to repatriate uh, our Indonesian seafarers uh, early. Uh, Early this year, when when the pandemic COVID-19 uh, started, uh, the biggest challenges is we don't know how many Indonesian seafarers are working overseas. That's that's the biggest challenge, and that's uh, uh, as give us a wake up call about the importance of uh, integrated database on how many Indonesian seafarers uh, working overseas. So in this regard, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has established uh, the uh, technological innovation uh, using uh, the uh, web-based application. We call it as a portal Peduli WNI. So the portal Peduli WNI is a, a web-based uh, application that can be used by all Indonesian 
living overseas, including seafarer, so they can uh, report uh, their uh, their uh, patient uh, whether working uh, in the special or stay in in uh, certain countries. So uh, we try also uh, with regard uh, and also uh, with the cooperation with with uh, Mr. Anthony, uh, Minister of uh, Transportation. We would like to integrate the uh, system with the uh, cement book uh, produced by uh, Ministry of Transportation, as well as uh, the Ministry, uh, the, uh, the, part, the DG of uh, Immigration, which produced the uh, passport. So with the uh, environment of integration between uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Transportation, and also DG of Immigration, we hope that we could uh, collect uh, more accurate data on how many Indonesian seafarer working overseas. And that's uh, by uh, that accurate data, we can provide uh, better protection for them, especially not only uh, handling the cases when the case is uh, pop up or erupted, but uh, taking some uh, preventive measure. I think that's, that's more important uh, during this COVID-19 that we could uh, uh, take a preventive action uh, for uh, better protection for our Indonesian seafarer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pak Yuda, for your answer. And do you have any other questions from the floor? Okay, we have this one question. Uh, this is about the implementation or compliance to the international law or international instruments remaining a problem to be solved in most of international issues. In this case, interpretation of an international legal instruments may vary. With regards to the MLC as the base for the protection of seafarers, not only but the patriation, do you think uh, developing a guideline for the implementation could assist member states? I believe this question uh, should be addressed to IMO, Mr. Jan de Boer. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Wina, for that question, which is uh, mm -hmm. a very uh, yeah, good one. Actually, um, in the framework uh, of the uh, Maritime Labor Convention, there is a tripartite uh, uh, spe special committee, the STC, uh, which uh, actually has issued uh, some some guidance uh, how to um, establish the uh, enforcement of the MLC, which is not an IMO instrument, but uh, which, which uh, we very much uh, endorse. Actually, how the MLC uh, is, is also uh, to be implemented uh, during COVID. And uh, on the website of ILO, there's a specific uh, reference uh, to, to that effect. Actually, in all our SCAT messages, we also make, make reference and I will uh, send you by a specific uh, message uh, the place where this can be found on the, on the web. But definitely there is uh, work done in this respect, also in relation to uh, the yeah, expiring of, of contracts, but it is all not 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 uh, yeah very easy uh, to interpret it uh, by by IMO. Uh, this should be done by the STC of uh, uh, ILO, and they have done that. Uh, but we make reference to that so uh, to promulgate the most clearance that we could give. I hope that satisfies the answer the question that was received by you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Jan de Boer. Do we see any questions from the floor? Our colleagues, perhaps, from another mission? I see none so far. Oh, yes, we have a question from Mr. Widya Satnovic from Indonesian Mission in New York. Silahkan, Pak Novik. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Buwina. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank uh, all the uh, uh, presenter for their uh, excellent uh, share with us this morning. Uh, I believe this is uh, really uh, important and also uh, multi, uh, 
multi uh, multi sector approach is really needed uh, here. Uh, I would like uh, I really enjoyed the presentations by uh, Pak Yuda and also Captain uh, uh, Anton on the uh, SOPs and also the uh, the work of uh, the government on how to handle this uh, crew change and also repatriations. Uh, I would like to also uh, probably uh, direct my questions to uh, IMO because uh, uh, we have, of course, uh, there's a problem of countries that uh, uh, put uh, some restrictions to the uh, to the to this uh, activities on crew changes and also repatriations. Uh, this is uh, based on the concern of the COVID-19. But I think there's also countries that uh, have a lack of capacities. Probably they they don't have a, they don't have a, this uh, standard operating procedures. They don't have a, a knowledge needed or uh, uh, equipment on on handling these issues. Basically, they don't know uh, what to do on this on this on these uh, situations. So uh, I would like to invite your comment whether the IMO could also or already provide a kind of uh, 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 best practices from from countries or. Uh, 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 propose some some uh, SOPs or uh, or capacity buildings to to this kind of situations. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, also to IMO uh, because during uh, our discussions uh, in New York, of course, uh, countries uh, are uh, seeing like Ambassador Koba said, uh, seeing these these problems uh, not only uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the 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 specific issues on the seafarers, but uh, when we, we talk about the uh, the impact of uh, seafarers uh, uh, challenges to the uh, global trade and also to the uh, to the shipping industries then it uh, really makes sense i think it's also uh, 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 important to the public when we we put the, this problem into into the pictures so more uh, more uh, 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 close to to the to the to the global trade to the economic to the to the daily situations uh, i don't know uh, uh, whether there's also cooperations between i know there's cooperation between imo and ilo but i don't know whether there's uh, uh, cooperations on on seeing these problems in the bigger picture with uh, for example antet or the wto uh, or or other uh, OECD, for example, for, for, for to uh, at least to, to give a, basically to give a, 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 a complete pictures, a compre comprehensive pictures on, on these issues. I uh, thank you. Uh, I will ask Mr. Deputy to respond to that question, please. Uh, well, it did it pleasure, uh, Ms. Vina, and uh, I think uh, for, for this question, because it's mm -hmm. uh, really uh, spot on uh, where we are. Uh, with all our work. Um, yeah, first and for all, um, IMO is doing uh, a tremendous job, well, uh, actually tr doing all their efforts actually to get the message across about um, how important it is that uh, seafarers are designated as key workers and that there are no travel impediments. Uh, we do have all the circulars, uh, I actually explained it in, in, in my presentation, but also we organize webinars uh, specifically dedicated for special regions. And we engage actually in the policy, the policy makers, industry, uh, and, and actually best practices are also being part of that to show uh, what uh, can help to alleviate uh, the, the whole issue. So um, from, from the perspective of uh, capacity, yes, we, we work on that, but uh, we also live in a virtual reality. So uh, the actually means of doing that are yeah, quite focused and, and uh, dedicated to uh, our means of communication at, at the moment. So the protocols are important, webinars, circulars, and actually engaging uh, with the public at large because the seafarers are approaching us. We try to help and we directly actually engage also with port states, with flag states, with uh, seafarer states and all the NGOs. And it helps. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, we do it all. ITF is doing a lot, uh, ICS, but uh, yeah, we have dealt with about 400 cases and actually those 400 cases represent uh, yeah, so, some thousands of individual seafarers. 
So uh, it's the top of the iceberg, but still we do that. And then we also reach out to the states actually to make them aware what this uh, legislation, the protocols actually entail and what is needed. And, and of course, if we then still see that uh, they not being followed, we, we yeah, discuss that uh, to say the least. About the uh, interagency work, yes, there is a lot of uh, process going on uh, to streamline, to coordinate all the different issues. Because now what we also see, we need to have a vaccination program for seafarers. That's not something that IMO uh, can, can do by itself. We need to have the World Health Organization and ILO there uh, to, to discuss that. So there is a lot of interagency. Uh, there is coordination with that. We have a strategy group uh, coordinating that. And there's also in the industry, a Corona strategy group. So we find ourselves all the time in these discussions. For myself, I find it very important uh, to get the seafarers being assisted. So I dedicate myself most to that work, but I also follow what's going on. That's why I can assure you that this coordination takes place and it's in good hands. And we work very close together with all our colleagues from ILO, the WHO, ICAO, uh, and, and also with, uh, with, with industries. I hope that uh, satisfies your, your question. Thank you, Mr. Jan de Boer. Uh, do we still have questions from the floor? This should be the last, yes, since we are nine minutes behind our schedule. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I see none. Oh, Rifki, uh, Mr. Rifki Akbar from Indonesian Embassy in Paris. Um, Please. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, you're very much audible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for Indonesian uh, Embassy in London for organizing this uh, webinar because this uh, issue is very important also for us, um, the representatives of Indonesia in Paris. Uh, I would like to highlight one of the points uh, that pointed out by Mr. Jan de Boer uh, regarding the, necess uh, the necessary of um, implementing, implementing appropriate uh, exemption from uh, national travel or movement uh, restriction. And because uh, based on experience, this is one of the this is actually one of the most um, difficult challenges uh, faced by our Indonesian seafarers. So for example, a few weeks ago, in the, one of Indonesian seafarers uh, uh, was on the, um, uh, was about to uh, repatriate, it, uh, repatriate it, but uh, he had um, difficulties in um, obtaining some, some visa, for example. Uh, uh, which uh, finally delay uh, the repatriation process. I would like to ask um, if there is any framework uh, that has been implemented or in progress um, um, uh, uh, pushed or uh, uh, supported by IMO to, to uh, solve uh, such a problem. Thank you very much. Please, you can answer this question, Mr. Ryan Debur. Apparently, all question has been directed to you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can imagine that uh, when you uh, actually are in, in in the middle of this crisis and uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and revealing actually what we are doing, that that invokes this discussion. I'm grateful for that uh, because I think uh, it shows also that uh, there is this interest to assist the seafarers, which are really need. And and as the gentleman. Uh, uh, your colleague from the embassy um, in, in, in Paris uh, is, is advocating. Uh, when there are uh, issues uh, to uh, yeah, a, a detrimental uh, treatment of, of seafarers, IMO is very keen to uh, assist when we have knowledge uh, about that, uh, to use our diplomatic channels actually to engage uh, with, with the, the states that are involved, but uh, also to find a uh, amicable uh, solution because uh, yeah, actually we have to face the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic is a very serious thing. Uh, 
and, and it is not without reason that there are all kind of restrictions being uh, in place. But still, uh, we see that in industry, in, in, in societies and, and, and in industries, we see that uh, essential workers have some privileges. And that should also be implemented for seafarers because they should also have the privileges to work for the whole global chain and also to have safe ships. Because uh, if the ships are not safe, uh, we have other problems. And we are facing that as well. And uh, that's why it's so key to our work at IMO that we address this and that we are uh, yeah, front running in crossing this message uh, in, in general. And when there ever there are these uh, individual cases, we try to address this with this generic approach. And we're not blaming and shaming. That's absolutely not our point of view. Our point of view is to get the message across. And I think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a humble civil servant, but uh, I'm quite proud about the rewards that we receive from seafarers that actually have yeah, been uh, resolved from a very difficult cir circumstances. And, and that's also what we receive on a daily basis. So it is effective to take this approach. But of course, it doesn't go without all the coordination between all the agencies and to spread the world that we have a basis actually to act on. That, that's key in, in, in our work. And you see, I'm quite passionate in what I'm doing because uh, yeah, actually I'm, I'm really working uh, uh, around the clock about this because it is also so rewarding. You don't want to miss uh, the opportunity to, to, to assist people. That's part of this. Uh, but but you have to 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 step back from to be too much in the in the public. But uh, be, be aware that this is ongoing in in, in IMO. I hope that satisfies your question. Thank you, Mr. Yandebur. I believe that ends uh, our question and answer session. And now I will. Return the forum to the Indonesian Embassy in London, Mr. Yando. Giving you the thank floor. You, thank you, moderator. Uh, on behalf of the embassy, I would like to, uh, before we close the webinar, I would like to thank all our uh, distinguished speakers: uh, Ambassador Muhammad Koba, Director Katie Ware, Director Judah Nugraha, Director Captain Anthony Yandebur from the IMO, uh, and also, of course, the moderator uh, uh, Ibu Wina and everyone who has taken the time to join the webinar, we would like to particularly express our gratitude to colleagues from missions of the Philippines, Thailand, Russia, Poland, Croatia, Spain, Singapore, Italy, and Ecuador, I'm sorry if I miss anyone, who have, uh, who have uh, joined the webinar uh, today. Uh, uh, as part of the organizing committee, we believe that uh, the webinar has been very useful in highlighting the adoption of the resolution and the international commitment that it represented. And just, just like Ambassador Koba said, it is only the beginning and international cooperation is the key. So from the perspective of the, the Indonesian Embassy here in London, we look forward to cooperating with relevant stakeholders, particularly the IMO, on how we can make the most of this resolution and improve situation on the ground, or rather in this case, at the sea for the seafarers. So thank you again, everyone, for, uh, for, for your time. Thank you, Pandu. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Pandu. Thank you. Thank you, Pandu. Thank you, Pandu. Thank you, Pandu. Thank you, Thank you, Pandu. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Katie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Yandubu. Thank you, Pandu. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone. Have a nice day. Terima kasih. Thank you, Pajan. Thank you, Pak Thank you, Pak Dubes. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Wai. Terima kasih, Pak Dubes, Pak Dewata, Pak Rektor Yuda, Pak Lolan, Pak Novik, dan semuanya. Kami izin live ya. Terima kasih, Bu Moderator. Terima kasih. Pak Antoni, terima kasih. Pak Antoni, ya terima kasih juga. Sampai lupa thank you, saya. Thank you, everyone. Bisa dia ngomong-ngomong. Thank you, everyone. Aimu emang gitu. Aimu.